Hello, welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This week we are covering issue 19 of Nintendo Power for December of 1990 and the final strategy guide issue of the magazine, this time covering games which support multi-tap. Now, in the past I have covered mul I have covered all games from a single player focused standpoint. And I'm still gonna do that. I'm not gonna be going, oh, this game is so much better on multi-tap or focus more on the multi-tap or that sort of thing. I will discuss whether or not I think a game would do well on multi-tap, but ultimately, unless you have picked up a four score or a um, NES satellite, you're probably not going to be playing these games multi-tap anyway, or if you're doing it on an emulator. But long story short, I'm focusing on the single player and can these games hold up on their own. So, we got, some, we got a bunch of ground to cover, so let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is a game I've actually already reviewed, having checked back through my archives. Play Action Football for the NES. The cover is also pretty generic, with some football players with no team logo on their uniforms, and their faces also not visible, bunt around a TV screen that's playing Play Action Football. And actually, these football players could probably just as easily be mannequins that are dressed up in football uniforms. Anyway, our first article of the issue is a list of the games that support Nintendo's two different multi-tap systems, the NES Satellite and the Four Score. And we're also going to run down of the two systems and what their similarities and differences are. The article focuses a lot more on the Satellite and more, and kind of tries to sell you more on the Satellite, but the NES satellite is a multi-tap system that works over infrared. It has an infrared transmitter that you have lined up with another transmitter or the receiver that you hook up to your NES. <clears throat> the problem with this is, if your signal goes out of alignment, then you lose gameplay inputs, um, which is a problem in games, because you need to have... A little to no input lag. If you lose, um, if your battery power on the satellite is to wire the system, if that starts to die down, the signal strength from the, from the transmitter dies down, and you have input lag. I mean, if you've ever, ever tried playing, uh, tried to change the channel on a television where either the, where you have an old remote with a dying battery, you can kind of imagine, okay, now take that problem with your slowly dying remote and have that happen with a NES controller or any video game controller, and you can immediately tell why the, the NES satellite is not ideal for game playing. Fortunately, as an alternative, we have the 4-score. The 4-score is a wired multi-tap system. It does pretty much everything the satellite does, except it's a wired connection. It still has a toggle uh, turbo button switch on the controller, on the, controller, on the uh, unit itself. You're set. Um, so, I mean, if you're going to go with a multi-tap system, and you're going to buy one now for either for your reproduction system or an NES or what have you, the 4-score is really the best option. Although, this does kind of remind me why it is that none of the reproduction systems and retro clone systems thus far haven't come out with multi-tap built in. Goodness knows, the GameCube supported four controllers out of the box. The Xbox original had four had four controller support out of the box. Um, all of these Bluetooth supporting and wireless controller supporting systems like the Wii, the Xbox 360, the PS4, all support four player out of the box. Even if you do things wired on the Xbox, on the uh, uh, PlayStation 4, particularly for the older models, they have um, it, the older model PS3. Um, sorry, had four controllers had four USB ports on the front, so you could still do four wired controllers all at once. So, why aren't we getting this with our retro clone systems? I mean, the closest we're getting now is the Retron 5, where the controller's done up for Bluetooth, 
I'm just saying. Moving on, next game we have, or the first game we have, is NES Play Action Football, a game which I have already reviewed, and which has already been covered in the magazine. So, this guide, though, is, I will say, far, far more comprehensive than the earlier articles in the game. In particular, the article gives rundowns of every single team in the game, their complete lineup, uh, their playbook, though not descriptions or pictures of the plays, and information on each team's strengths and weaknesses. This is probably the, the best guide you could possibly om- hope for, almost the best guide you could hope for, for this game. The one thing I'd say it's missing is, again, pictures of the plays. So you go, okay, this is what these plays do. Now I know, that sort of thing. Um, then, our next game is will be the first game that we will be reviewing this issue, and that is Gauntlet 2, which is like Gauntlet 1, except now with four-player co-op gameplay, which brings it closer to the arcade version. It does not have the same amount of digitized speech samples as the original game did, but hey, it's the NES. There's only so much you can ask for. The article gives a list of power-ups and some level maps, as well as some character-specific gameplay strategies. As it is, Gauntlet 2 is, as I said, Gauntlet. If you played Gauntlet, you know how this plays. It's a top-down sh- shooter where you move your character in four, in actually eight directions, including the diagonals, and you shoot monsters, you find treasure, which increases your point total, you get food, which increases your health gauge, which is slowly ticking down in addition to damage you take from monsters to bring it down further. Um, the monsters are spawned from monster generators. You destroy the generators to stop the flow of monsters. All this sorts of stuff. Um, so, honestly, this is the kind of game which works better multiplayer anyway. Original Gauntlet supported two-player. This game brings up the four-player, which is what the arcade machine did. The arcade cabinet did. If you enjoyed Gauntlet, you will like this game. You will probably like it even more if you have four people to play it with. If you don't have people to play it with and you're playing it solo, this game is probably not going to be as fun as you might like. And so, I'd say as far as retro games go, this is definitely one of those games for people with roommates who like to play retro games. Next up is Nintendo World Cup from Technos, the creator of the Kunio Kun series. Viewers may be familiar with earlier games in the series, such as Renegade, which I kind of panned, and River City, River City Ransom, which I enjoyed immensely. There are games, the, the Kun Yukun franchise tends to focus more on Japanese du- juvenile delinquents being juvenile delinquents and beating the crap out of people. Um, you can kind of tell that this game was born as a Kun Yukun game, just from the, not just the graphical style, but some of the more absurd gameplay elements that you can see here, like, for example... We have soccer fields that are ice, or sand, like, you know, desert or beach sand. However, instead of this game being released as, say, River City Soccer, this game was licensed by Nintendo and put out as Nintendo World Cup. The article itself has a rundown of each of the teams in the game, and their strengths and weaknesses. Now, Nintendo World Cup is probably the best playing soccer game I've played on the NES thus far. The controls are simple enough to be easily manageable on the NES's gamepad, and they are also able to encompass basically everything you need to do in a soccer game. The pass button with the D-pad um, directs the pass straight to whatever player you want it to go to. Um, the D-pad with the shoot button angles the shot to hopefully get it past the goalie, and additionally, the two buttons on the controller as far as A and B handle perfectly tackles against opponents and yeah basically to either just like slide tackles or you know roughing people up which leads to the kunio kun side of things because if you've been watching the world cup this year or ever you may know that there are these things in soccer called yellow cards red cards which are handed out when players do things like rough up other players those don't exist in this game now, this does fundamentally change the strategy of how soccer works in here, because one of the things in soccer that's important strategy is 
penalty kicks and set pieces, which give people a chance to line up the shot, take it, and possibly bounce the, bounce the ball either off of one of the members of the opposing team or letting one of your players kick the ball in or head the ball in, that sort of thing. Also, offsides in here are not a thing that exists. So, there's that bit as well. Still, this is straight up a really fun soccer game. It kind of passes my little personal test of if I can't get enough players together to play a real game of soccer or it's the weather conditions are too cruddy to do soccer, would this be a decent little pickup equivalent? Can I get maybe not exactly as much fun, but an equal amount of fun due to playing soccer? It's just a different kind of fun than actually playing, but it's it's fun, it is enjoyable, it is definitely worth picking up. Next is a co-op dungeon crawler with uh, swords and serpents. The article itself has maps of the game's levels, as well as advice on playing the game. What's particularly notable is the article gives advice on giving each of the players roles, in addition to their characters having roles. Similar to the roles that players in Gary Gygax's D&D campaigns he had would have. Um, it's kind of described in the Book of Dice and Men, which I'm currently reading by, right now. The book is by David M. Ewald. Um, you have a caller or a leader who handles basically telling the GM, okay, th here's what the party's doing, here's where we're going, here's actions, whether we're checking for traps, that sort of thing. There is a cartographer whose job it is to map the dungeon. There is a designated note-taker who keeps track of important clues, and there is a banker who handles treasure and other similar inventory management. So, the game, the article recommends basically giving your players similar roles as well. You have the guy who actually moves the party through the dungeon, you have someone who handles the overarching map, and other, other similar sorts of things. Also, the game combines clerics and magic users into one class, just the, the magician, and in turn, the article advises basically having one magician who focuses on doing offensive damage and another who buffs and heals. Gameplay-wise, Swords of Serpents is, to my knowledge, the only first-person dungeon crawler designed specifically for the NES and was never ported for any other system. Not MS-DOS computers, not Windows, not stuff like the FM Towns or the um, NEC PC or anything like that. Additionally, this game was developed by Interplay, specifically by Brian Fargo, who audiences may know as the guy behind the Fallout and Wasteland series and one of the founders of Interplay as a whole. Swords and Serpents, Serpents simplifies the dungeon crawler incredibly well. The game provides an always visible auto map in the upper right hand corner of the screen, which is replaced by monsters, life bars, while in combat. The bottom of the screen tells you what your piece, what your HP and spell points are through a similar bar gauge, though unfortunately it's rather tricky to get numeric information without going through a bunch of menus. Attributes are boiled down to three stats. Strength, which affects how much damage you do. Intelligence, which affects your spell points. And agility, which affects accuracy. And then intelligence and agility also determine how frequently you attack. Additionally, the game also has one class kind of specializing in each attribute. Magicians focus on intelligence, surprisingly. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, magicians also are the cast all are the catch all spellcasters, able to both heal and buff the party and harm enemies. Then thieves, who are able to randomly hit enemies with an insta kill sneak attack, and warriors who can use the best weapons and armor in the game. The game plays incredibly well, and I'd say that this is one of the best dungeon crawlers on the, the NES, were it not for a few little hiccups. First, you can't zoom the map out to see where you are in relation to the rest of the dungeon level, at least where you've previously been. Consequently, you're kind of best off either drawing a dungeon map by hand to go with the in-game map, or finding one online or using the one the strategy guide. Second, and most important, there is no battery backup so you can't save your game. Instead, when you go to the save option on the menu, the game generates one password for each party member, then a password for where you are in the dungeon. 
At best, this is a hassle where you can stop, you have to bust out some graph paper or an additional sheet of graph paper because you've got one for your main map, or a notebook to keep track of everyone's passwords for their characters, which are going to evolve and change as you go through the game. At worst, having to manage multiple passwords makes it really easy for you to either lose your gameplay progress your or mess up your characters tremendously. Finally, I can't see this as a game that's enjoyable to play with four players. I mean, to a certain degree, considering that, like, at the time this came out, video games then would cost about the equivalent of $50 to $60 now, it'd probably be easier with the number of players to just buy a copy of Dungeons & Dragons and run that. Um, the, the idea is novel, and other games you kind of play with doing multiplayer for an RPG, like Secret of Mana, or action RPGs, or Final Fantasy VIII, letting the second player also control another player and another other party members in combat. But I could see the other players being kind of bored because it's not like they're actually with a role-playing game. The player can play a role. The player plays a role, and they can do interactions and stuff beyond just, you know, pushing buttons on a controller um, that affect the, the flow of the game and that sort of thing. Although, the assigning roles thing, aside from just, you know, logistical flow of things and making sure no one's overwhelmed, it does have the one advantage of it gives everybody something to do, kind of. It's not great, but it kind of works. Still, this is one of those games where it's really best suited for being played on the virtual console, were it to be made available there, or to be played on an emulator or on a console like the Retron 5, which supports save states. On an original system or a retro clone that attempts to mimic the NES hardware, it becomes far too easily easy for an otherwise enjoyable gameplay experience to kind of end in frustration. If you want to give it a shot, it's fine, just give me all a heads up. Next is Super Spike V-Ball, which is another game I previously reviewed, and I'll put a link to the episode where I reviewed it in the show notes. The guide gives a rundown of each of the teams, including one made up of the Double Dragon protagonists. Then we have Ivan Iron Man Stewart's Super Off-Road next, and this is the third game I reviewed this far, and just to add to the re reuse and rerun fun, the guide is a rerun of the guide that was run earlier in Nintendo Power. For shame. Finally, we wrap up this issue with a rundown of other four-player games that were not considered worthy of getting their own full guides. Some of them, like Kings of the Beach, I understand why they weren't included uh, due to the redundancy, though I could probably argue that dropping Super Spike V-Ball and using Kings of the Beach instead would probably be a better option. Others, like Mule, on the other hand, certainly merit their own guides. They have enough complexity and interesting strategy to them that then they can provide a something different take on the multiplayer experience, the multi-tap experience, far more than something like Super Off-Road could, but if they win again, you're just reusing content you created already. So my pick of the game for this issue is Gauntlet 2, or rather it's my multiplayer pick of the issue. Um, it's a game which really benefits a lot more from having uh, multiple players, be it 2 or 3 or 4, than the uh, than it does for having just one person playing it solo. Um, I can it's plus additionally with with all the chaos and action happening at once, it works better as a couch multiplayer game because of everything going on and people ribbing each other or chewing each other out for because Elf shot the food or Valkyrie shot the food or what have you. Somebody shot the food. All there's always someone who shoots the food. Um, or is getting somebody to come over and do something, and all that sort of thing. Um, it's a much, I'd say it's about the, the strongest as a multiplayer game of all the games on here. With the volleyball games coming in probably a close second. As far as single player games go, um, I'd say actually Nintendo World Cup is a really strong contender. Uh, though, if you have a Retron 5, I definitely recommend going and checking out Swords and Serpents. 
because while playing Sword and Serpents on the original NES hardware doesn't work as well because having to deal with the password crap and all that sort of thing. On something where you have save states and able to save your game, whether it's the Return 5, whether it's Virtual Console, um, or just an emulator, I feel that Swords and Serpents stands up better, as I mentioned earlier, on those platforms. Next time is episode 30, and with it, Nintendo Power issue 20. And we're getting the big one this time, Mega Man 3. That's something definitely to look forward to, and I'll see you then.